Well, yeah, I wanted to take this opportunity this morning to really bring some of the, the leaders in the advanced nuclear industry to the front of the room to, to talk about not only what's going on within your own organizations, but really talk about some of the trends that we're seeing uh, in the advanced nuclear space as we continue down the road to commercialization of multiple different uh, advanced reactors and, and finally deployment, hopefully by the end of this decade. Uh, James, let me start with you because nanonuclear is really one of the, the newest entrants into the, uh, into the advanced nuclear industry. Can you, can you take a few minutes and just kind of talk about nano uh, uh, the technologies that you guys are developing and sort of what your, your thoughts and vision are for the, the future as we move ahead? Testing, hello, okay. So the, the people actually were behind the start of nano. They didn't start actually necessarily with nuclear. They, the energy space seemed very important and um, like that. <laughs> okay, all right, better. Um, so they didn't necessarily start with nuclear. Actually, they, they wanted, they saw energy as becoming an increasingly important concern um, nationally, internationally. And actually it was a sobering um, analysis of the entire energy market. And that included a lot of renewables. But when they started looking at things like wind and solar, they realized that um, land usage it was very locationally dependent, um, needed huge storage facilities. The, um, the price of it was come, it had come down and sort of had plateaued and there didn't look to be a lot of innovation and that steered them to nuclear. Um, but once they looked at the nuclear space, they, um, they saw obviously the big civil power reactors were very likely to be replaced by SMRs because um, you could get them to market quicker. Um, they could be mass manufactured. Um, potentially um, what, more safe as well, because as, as you reduce, they get um, less mechanical components. Um, but actually, when we looked at that space, we realized that even um, at the microreactor space, smaller than SMR, that could be the potentially larger untapped market. And that's actually where we steered to, because we were looking at um, how nuclear could be used at um, projects like um, mining, oil and gas, uh, remote habitation, remote industrial projects, charging stations, freebie vehicles. Um, data centers, uh, military bases, that, that kind of thing. And so we steered the, the company in that direction. And so once we um, settled on um, that as being um, the better option within the nuclear space, we brought in a couple of scientific teams, um, uh, one drawn predominantly out of, um, from professors and scientists out of the University of Berkeley, California, and um, one uh, drawn from scientists and professors from University of Cambridge. And we gave them the same MO. We said, we need this to be small, portable, modular, very few working parts. Um, if every mechanical component was to break, we need this to be able to passively cool because ultimately what we want to do is deploy a reactor that does not need a lot of maintenance work, does not need a lot of people at site, can be remotely operated. Um, and so that's where they began. So we now have two fairly advanced designs that we want to start taking into um, demonstration and test work in the near future. Um, Zeus reactor being a, a solid core battery. And the reason for that is the um, nuclear battery. We removed all the coolant out of it. So it's no pumps, no pressurizer, uh, simplifying the process as much as we possibly could. And the Odin reactor, um, uh, again, could passively cool system, but used solar salts. Um, both, are, both trying to cater to slightly different markets. Zeus operating at a higher temperature for the um, ease of things like um, hydrogen production and Odin reactor, um, uh, just less wear on it and could operate from a lot longer and higher thermal output for industrial processes. Um, because we, we saw that that could potentially be, we weren't, we weren't trying to hit grid, um, but we saw that industry was going to be needing to try and power their operations increasingly with nuclear in the future. And that's, that's the believe, um, direction we believe we're, we're heading in and that the market was heading in. And, and actually, since we started, um, we started before this nuclear renaissance actually began. And um, uh, since then, support from government, industry, even public sentiment has all improved markedly. And you've just seen a um, huge amount of investment coming into the nuclear space uh, since we started that. So. Great. Thank you for that. Seth, let me turn to you. Uh, you do not, uh, you're not in the business of developing advanced reactors, but you are in the business of providing the fuel for those reactors. Can you talk a little bit about Lightbridge and the technologies that you're currently working on and uh, sort of what, what you're seeing as the opportunities that are out there in the market, both domestically and internationally for, for your company? 
Right. Well, at Lightbridge, we started with um, talking with large utilities that own and operate reactors, and we're planning to develop SMRs uh, about their needs, their, their wants, and we formed an advisory board comprised of people from four utilities that generate over half the nuclear power in the United States. And we also developed a team of brilliant engineers and listening to the customers about what they want and working with the engineers to develop it, we came up with a metallic fuel that, that uses HALU that would be usable in the existing large reactors in, in, in a very advanced technology for this fuel, but also in the water-cooled SMRs, like New Scale, Rolls-Royce, Holtec, GE Hitachi are developing. And we're working in particular with Idaho National Laboratory and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. We've been producing fuel samples. We're going to be uh, testing and qualifying them in the advanced test reactor and in the treat reactor at Idaho National Lab. And this fuel is designed to bring significantly improved economics to the existing large reactors and the new SMRs through power upgrades, through longer fuel cycles, avoiding paying for as many outages, as well as significantly enhanced safety, non-proliferation, and ability to load follow with renewables on a zero carbon grid. So uh, I know both Lightbridge and Nanonuclear are also involved in the, uh, in the HALU consortium. James, I want to turn back to you just really quickly. Can you talk about uh, what Nanonuclear is also doing with respect to HALU? <clears throat> yep. So when we, um, when we started trying to de-risk the company, we were looking at um, how are we going to deploy this reactor? How is it going to be fueled? Um, Idaho actually steered us in the direction of HALU, and they said, you've really got to consider your fuel very carefully because... Um, a lot of companies are having a lot of difficulty now. They're, they're, where's this fuel actually going to ultimately come from? Um, and when we looked uh, at the infrastructure in the United States, it seemed that it, it had atrophied a little bit. There was no HALU deconversion facility, fuel fabrication facility. Um, and so obviously this looked like um, an enormous problem for trying to launch a reactor business. Um, but there was also a lot of opportunity in there. And so um, we settled on... Um, uh, establishing our own fuel fabrication facility. And the intention there was one, so we could obviously supply our own reactors, but it could act as a secondary business where we would um, be able to supply other SMR and micro-reactor companies. So um, we do have a partnership with Centris, but ultimately um, we're looking to source uh, fuel that we're going to fabricate into uranium dioxide, um, uranium um, and, uh, and metals and, and other forms that would be uh, utilized in other reactors. So th that was really the idea behind it. It's, um, we submitted uh, applications uh, in partnership with INL to the DOE, and we've been um, discussing with them for the past year, um, just increasing amounts of detail about the facility, utilities, where it will be sited. And the intention will be um, to start more comprehensive work next year, um, which we've raised the financing for now to look at things like cost estimation work, scoping studies for it, but ultimately to try and build that as really as quick as possible because there's an emerging market there and um, even whatever happens with our microreactors, that fuel is going to be needed and that product will be needed by industry. Great, thank you. Jim, let me turn to you. Uh, you're not a developer, you're not producing fuel, uh, but you are in the banking business providing investment capital for the companies that we represent. Can you talk a little bit about your career because you've been doing this for a long time uh, talk about what the current uh, environment looks like for investment in the advanced nuclear space and and, and so, uh, some of uh you know the opportunities and challenges moving forward so i've been around um, the energy space for 28 years now and um as far as the scene at hand goes um what we have Emerging is a little bit like looking at an ocean. I'm not going to go through my background, by the way. I'm a banker and I'm an intermediary and I don't invest, but I've observed investors and I've observed client needs for a long time. Um, my analogy here is watching the ocean. We've all sat on a shore and watched waves crash, they just roll in, they roll in. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. To me, and I've said this a lot, um, the demand picture is a little bit like watching a tsunami. Um, you know, the ocean recedes, 
nothing happens for a while. And then all of a sudden the wave hits, at least that's my understanding. I've never seen a tsunami and I hope to never see one, but basically the question is, are we ready for that tsunami or not? And to me, I define that as follows. We're going to have an enormous amount of pressure placed on the grid. Demand is going to go up dramatically as much as three times in the next 20 years. And what we have on the grid today globally is at least, let's say between North America, Europe, Asia, at least 75% of the world's electrons come from fossil fuels. And if our goal really is to be clean, and at the same time, we're going to have a doubling or tripling of demand for electrons in the next 20 years or so, we have a huge problem on our hands. And the only path forward is through advanced reactors, um, whether it's micro, SMRs, um, larger you know, third gen designs like the AP 1000s. So whatever the mix is at the end of the day, and I think investors look at each of those little subspaces differently, given the amount of capital required for each arena, micro reactors don't require as much upfront capital. So in theory, investors will have more appetite for those designs. Um, the large scale capital needs and the perceived risk of first of a kind designs for SMRs and larger third gen units, you know, there's, it's gonna be hard to raise the capital. Um, right now we're going through a hard time. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to measure here is, yes, there's been a lot of improvements over time in terms of how we think about this subspace broadly defined. There's been a huge amount of recognition in what I just said is the need for new nuclear. People are understanding that now. They weren't maybe five, six years ago, three years ago. So they see the need, they see the great technology that we have and other nations that are friendly to us have. But look, at the end of the day, what hasn't happened on the SMR side to be blind, and even on the microreactor side is we don't have hard customer contracts. So that tsunami, that demand signal that I'm talking about, to me, without that, it's gonna be really hard to raise large sums of capital. That's, I, I can't name names, We've worked with a number of companies publicly, New Scale, X Energy, Oklo. I'm not going to analyze those, but what I will tell you is we need contracts. The, and we, I'm talking about customers, um, the, I'm sorry, the OEMs. Uh, we have a weird ecosystem, and I can go on. I'll cut myself short here in a second. The natural customers for these units um, are utilities, right? And there's others, right? There's others that can be IPPs. There's funds that want to be IPPs or raise the money to become so. Could be government organizations that ultimately buy these units like TVA, OPG. Um, but at the end of the day, the uh, ecosystem is conservative on the customer side. And that's a little unique. The other part of it is the ecosystem's not great on the regulatory front. I mean, I don't wanna, you know, and there's been a lot of changes at the federal level, state level, uh, potentially. But look, at the end of the day, we need a greased pathway for this industry to really accelerate and meet the demand that's out on the horizon. And everybody that's involved in this needs to understand how important this technology is and do their part in making this happen. Um, I'll hit pause because I'll, I'll just keep going. So I, ho I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to follow up though really quickly. Earlier this year, you were talking with, uh, with someone else at a different organization. Uh, but what you said was that the federal government here in the U.S. and I'll take that a little further, governments overseas as well, uh, need to be getting involved in the financing uh, of this, the, at least the early stage financing of this industry. Later today, we'll have a panel where we've got people from U.S. Trade Development Agency and XM Bank and the DFC here to talk about what they're doing. But can, can you elaborate a little bit more on the need for early stage action from governments across the globe? So look, I, I think the nice thing here is that I, I, um, I see in North America, the US and Europe, um, a recognition at the federal levels that we need this technology and a real willingness to help. Um, the issue is the customer demand signal. Um, I won't name or start going into politics, but at the end of the day, there's a good amount of folks you know, that sit in office that are sitting there saying, we really wanna help. We wanna commit more resources, money, maybe grants, maybe insurance money, and certainly the LPO office has done a lot, Jigger and his team are amazing. And you know they're ready to go, but at the end of the day, we're missing a piece of the, of the tools and the toolkit. And frankly, that's equity because the upfront risk again is enormous without having clear customer demand signals, i.e. contracts. If I had contracts, hard contracts, 
I, the banker for some of these companies, we can raise a lot more money. If you marry contracts and more upfront government support for some of these um, expensive, um, large-scale platforms, then we could really roll. Um, at the end of the day, and I hate to say this, this is an industry that demands an oligopolistic framework and fast. Back in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think I have my history wrong, Admiral, Admiral Rickover weighed heavily on the designs that we ultimately chose. And a lot of people think probably to this day that maybe those decisions were bad and maybe top-down decisions are not good. But what I am saying is to really accelerate, you know, to really meet that wave that's about to happen, we got to make some hard decisions and fast. And our ecosystem is not really set up to do that. We're a free market economy, a lot of companies, a lot of ideas, a lot of money floating around without a clear direction. Where does it need to go now? I can keep going, but I'll pause. Thanks, Jim. Uh, James, I'm going to turn back to you. You mentioned it earlier in one of, uh, in one of your answers, but uh, Nano had a, a very successful uh, fundraising round earlier this year, uh, which was described by the company as oversubscribed, which is always a good thing. Uh, but you know, as I said, you're early stage. You're not uh, fully commercialized. You're not out signing contracts quite yet. Uh, but can you talk about from where you sit, why that round was so successful uh, and why you think the investors that decided to invest in Nano got involved when they did? So um, he's absolutely right. Like there is um, not reluctance exactly, but a, um, a slow approach from industry to really get involved or, or government to commit, you know, heavy, hefty amounts of money. But, you know, the intonations are there that they are moving in that direction. Um, I th there are a lot of investors out there who are really trying to analyze the market. And I, I think they've all, a lot of them have settled on the realization that these mandates are coming into play in these large companies. Like say um, one of the, like the big mining majors is an example, um, incredibly uh, fossil fuel intensive, but they have mandates to completely reduce their, their output. And so the, when these mandates are there and you realize that there's no other solution other than nuclear for these sites, because maybe the mine is in a location where there's not much sun or wind or not near um, a hydro plant. Um, they can only settle on nuclear. When they see that, um, and they know that nuclear has to be a solution, it's really a, a, a question for them of who to invest in. You know, essentially investing is always a gamble, but who to gamble on that is going to produce the solution to meet the demands of these large companies who have put these mandates in place. So the round was successful, I think, one um, got very, some very high net worth individuals um, that, that analyzed that energy space, saw these mandates that were coming in from heavy industry. Um, and that's where a lot of the funding came from. But we had engaged with a lot of nuclear industry too. And so even though, say, a, a billionaire took out the whole round, there were a lot of industry personnel who had, had insight into what we were doing. And um, they came in as well and they invested heavily in, in that round too. And that's why it was oversubscribed in the end, because even though it was taken out, um, a lot of people within the community who see the direction things are going and they see the resurgent interest, um, they also wanted to try and invest in that potential future as well. So it's you can get nice receptions like that, but ab absolutely you can get those difficulties where um, the, the huge capital expenditures that, uh, or investments that are required for, say, SMRs in particular, where the, the capital cost could be pretty substantial. Um, there's not a wariness, but a, a carefulness that's still in place at the moment, rather than um, sort of the flood that you would need at the moment to really push that industry to meet these all these, these deadlines and these mandates. So let me turn back to you. Uh, you're not an early stage company, as we talked about already, uh, and you're currently listed on, on the NASDAQ. Uh, from, from that perspective, can you talk about uh, rather than having to go out and, you know, as a small early stage company trying to raise capital uh, the way that Nano has been doing, uh, what it's like to be running a company in this industry right now that's, that is currently listed, that's public, um, and the types of things that you have to do to try to drive investors to the space as, uh, as a CEO of a company? One of the things we hear from investors is that we're uniquely transparent there's the combination of being publicly traded with our filings and a very strong principle of transparency in the company. And another is choosing to go the patent route for most of our technology and making it uh, 
very much available. There's very little pure nuclear publicly traded and within that very little making their technology as public as we do. And what, what we hear from investors, some are very enthusiastic about new nuclear technology, some less enthusiastic. And among those that are less enthusiastic, I hear a lot of agreement on the facts. It's more disagreement about the vision of the future. And some say, well, we don't need it. We have wind, we have solar, we have batteries, we have carbon capture. I'm not in that camp, but that'll cover everything. But that's what some people believe. And another is that, well, we believe all this energy that nuclear could produce. It's very promising technology, but we just don't believe the industry has its act together. It's too diffuse, too many technologies, money being spread too thin by government and private investors. And you just haven't demonstrated as an industry the ability to deliver on time and on budget. And there's a lot going on to address those things. And at Lightbridge, we have an advantage of 400 existing reactors that, that, that could use our fuel and an advantage of not having to build a new reactor. We could use existing test reactors and start out with a market with our advanced fuel technology into existing reactors and then new SMRs and others that are built. But we're, we're, we're in a strong position. We have about two years of cash. We have no debt. We have government funding and support. So we're, we're very confident at where we are. Thanks, Seth. Uh, this question is, is going to be posed really for all of you. Um, and it'll harken back, I think, to some of the things that you said, Jim, about not having the contracts right now. But the, the U.S. Department of Energy earlier this year in their Pathway to Advanced Nuclear Commercial Liftoff Report uh, estimated that U.S. domestic nuclear capacity has the potential to scale from 100 gigawatts, where we're at right now in 2023, to 300 gigawatts by 2050. And that's driven by the deployment of advanced nuclear technologies. And just last month, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, again increased its annually released projection for global nuclear capacity to 890 gigawatts electric from uh, by 2050 from the 369 where we sit globally today. So I think an important thing, for especially for IAEA's projection, is that from 2020 to 2023, that projection went up 25%. So globally, I think you know, the trend is lots more nuclear. But as you said, no current contracts. So from each of your perspectives, can, we, can, can you talk to that particular point about the, the growing recognition that capacity is likely going to be increased uh, significantly over the next 27 years and how we are going to get there? Well, you're saying we don't have contracts right now. If we hit those numbers, or if we're going to hit those numbers, those contracts are going to have to eventually come. So how do we bridge that delta right now to, to get to be successful and hit those numbers down the road? I, I think that you have to look at who are the folks that are going to be using all these clean electrons, uh, a lot of new clean electrons in the coming years. In, in my mind, and where a lot of our work is going to be focused is on the end users, like the data centers, as an example and potentially carbon capture companies, the oil companies, right? So we have utilities in the middle, you have munis, you have other federal agencies, they're all potential deployers of this technology, but I view that crowd as not being set up to move quickly on this front. I think with a push from the potential um, end users of, this, uh, of this, this product, you know, 24 hour a day, 365 day a year, clean baseload stuff, it's not hydrogen. It's not geothermal. We're not going to dam any more rivers. Uh, it has to be new nuke. That crowd has the money and the ability to step up and do this. And to be honest with you, it's, you know, it's a hard conversation to have because really what it comes down to is if there aren't hard federal mandates or state mandates, you know, there's goals, but are there really hard lines in the sand on clean? The answer is no. That means that the folks that really want to be clean, that have the money need to step up and get this thing going. Because once it does get rolling, once we do pick a few pathways, I do believe in the industry's ability to drive down costs. I believe that we get, if we get good at manufacturing uh, these products, if we work with our partners overseas, you know, we come together and recognize how strategic this sector is globally, then we'll do the right thing. We'll, you know, folks will step up, folks will contract. To me, that's the only way forward. It's not gonna just be government driving this. Um, I would love to say that if we can get $20 billion from the federal government, 
allocate it to four or five different pathways. We'd have this thing rolling. We may need that in the end, but without a customer signal that's strong, it's going to be hard to meet those goals. I believe that we will, but we got to have real conversations. Industry needs to team up. People need to get together and think through this fast. Thanks. Seth? No, I completely agree. And I think that we're going to need to get to a point where we produce reactors like we produce commercial aircraft by the tens, by the hundreds, ultimately, if need be, by the thousands and are deploying them to, to sites around the world where there's only civil construction akin to building a landing strip at those sites, not like building an aircraft. And um, the customer signals are coming in terms of energy demand from the data centers and others, but not yet really for, for the reactors. And, you know, one of the issues we hear from customers is questions about companies that are technology development companies becoming industrial companies and deployment companies, you know, with the current teams. And that's why it's so important to have the right partners, the companies, you know, that, that, that can do that. They, they can manufacture and they, they can help deploy or, or bring new people in as well. So I, I absolutely agree that the opportunity is there. It can be met. And I, I think in the next few years, we'll see some emerging success stories. Great. Thanks, Seth. James? Um, it's interesting you mentioned the, like that revised estimate between 2020 and 2023, and um, I would imagine that might partially be attributed to um, that realization that the other alternatives that were being examined weren't going to fill that gap. And um, uh, you could see probably see that reflected actually in the stocks, which are usually a good indicator of people's real sentiment. And you see wind and solar stocks actually now falling quite steadily. So. The market has interpreted that as, you know, the the industry is those industries is not being able to satisfy that big demand, and it's probably going to go somewhere else. Um, we are in that um, situation, whereas uh, uh, he said, um, "It's free market economy; the money might be spread very thinly." I think the government, even though it is now um, being very supportive of nuclear, and it's one of the few issues where it's got very strong bipartisan support on both fronts. Um, and so you're seeing um, FOAs and um, RFPs being released by government for the, for the deliberate promotion of this. It's ultimately, I think, going to be driven by industry and the, the larger companies that do want to power these data centers, um, these, these, uh, the new AI, for instance, uses up enormous amounts of power, but even um, chemical plants, um, processing uh, plants, big industry centers that currently just run on fossil fuels, gas, coal. Um, the only solution there is nuclear. And, you know, Seth mentioned as well, being able to manufacture hundreds of these things. The, the advantage here is that the new technologies do allow for sort of mass manufacturing, almost like an assembly line. Um, the initial ones will be expensive. The, the subsequent ones will be cheap. I think really getting to that point where the first one's going out the door um, that will create the momentum that you can then just start deploying many. You get the economy of scale then. But it's, it's just that getting to initial market is going to be the tough part. Once it gets there, I think it'll just take over very quickly and the cost of nuclear will fall even further. Um, ultimately, I think it will, it will be cheaper than gas and coal, um, especially as the cost of enriching nuclear material comes down, which it will. Um, and then at that point, I don't think there'll be anything to rival it. And you'll see, you'll see those hundreds of reactors going out of the door. So. Jim, did you have a, another comment? Yeah, I think that the analogy, another analogy that I'd like to leave folks with is just that this is like a football game. And we have an all-star team. Um, name your football all-star team, college, professional. But we're on the five-yard line on the wrong end of the field. And there's a 10 foot high brick wall on the 10 yard line. And that 10 foot high brick wall is comprised of lack of customer contracts, an unfair playing field, lack of cooperation across industry, um, an unclear regulatory environment, no offense at both the federal and state levels. And then an unwillingness in Western Wall Street world to take long-term risks. And so if you address those five things, the ball will arrive at the 20 yard line and this industry will roll. It will roll. And somebody is going to make a lot of money. Um, I don't know if GE's in the room or listening. I don't want to offend anyone at GE, but would GE folks in 1955 have questioned their investments in jet engine technology? 
How did that work out? It's the same thing here. And by the way, remember what happened then. We borrowed that technology from another country at the end of a war, sort of. And, you know, there's other things that went on. I think our military needed it, right? Commercial aviation benefited a lot from those investments then and to this day. And to this day, that technology, the best, sits here in this country and some of our friends' countries. So we got to think about it like that. Everybody involved here needs to think a little bit differently and aggressively and wake up. Because at the end of the day, for us to address some of the fundamental challenges we have around a lot of debt, lack of jobs, lack of high paying jobs, when you have the vision that this industry can pick up the slack in a lot of ways in those areas. So that's, that's the way I think about this. Thanks. I, I wanna go ahead and now open it up to the audience for questions. Um, we've got a couple of microphones that'll be around the room. So if you have a question for any of our panelists, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. I know it's early, but don't be shy. <laughs> right behind you. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> Shout. Good morning. Three times over. Here we go. One, two, three. Good mornings. Four for you, too. Uh, Jim Riley. Um, I have a question for Nano. You're down there in the one to five megawatt range. That's pretty much what you're looking at at Project Pele for the portable um, microreactor for the military. And you're looking for a customer in commercial areas, maybe, maybe military also, but thinking of your customers in the commercial area, how are you thinking about exclusion zones? Because you have to be pretty close to your customer in order to make a, a difference to them. You're not going to do good to you know a wholesale market at the gigawatt level. So how are you addressing exclusion area issues? <clears throat> so um, obviously the the type of industry you're deploying to will depend on that exclusionary zone. So say for instance it's a mining project as an example, and we're we're charging things like um, offices, electric vehicles, things like that. Um, at that sort of site where you've got um, say drill and blast operations. Um, you would obviously need to be removed substantially from that blast. So you do, you, the seismic activity does not affect the reactor design. It is going to be very situationally dependent. Um, I would like to see from obviously the regulators some sort of framework that allows for reactors to be deployed where they just have to meet certain criteria. So say, for instance, that incorporates things like seismic considerations, temperature considerations, uh, flooding risk, things like that. And provided that you wouldn't need a separate site licensing agreement, you would just need to meet that criteria. I think if that is established by the regulator, one that allows for reactors to be deployed a lot faster and a lot easier and a lot more cheaply, but it will dictate that exclusionary zone as well. Um, that, that also seems to be the, the, the best approach, I think, to deploying these things um, at, at scale and quickly. Um, but, and, you know, they're pushed for staff as well, so I'm sure they, it's been in their interest as well to to put these regulations in. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be very industry and situationally dependent. So. I think we've got a question up here in the front of the room. Uh, yes, Scott Nelson, Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, I'm kind of curious, this is a question for all of you, um, but if you had to select like one present challenge uh, in the area of technology, finance, regulation, or testing and development of your nuclear uh, fuel, or plants or anything of that nature, uh, what would you pick and what is, that, what is that item that you have to overcome right now? Seth, you wanna kick this one off? Yes. Yeah, so, so what we have to do now is um, demonstrate that what we've designed will, will do what we say it does. So the testing in the advanced test reactor at INL and in the treat reactor for transient testing including under accident type conditions uh, that the fuel physically performs as the modeling and simulation and the out of pile testing and, and all of that indicates. Uh, so that's what we're heading into. So physically producing product and, and testing it. And I, I would say in the case of say uh, micro reactors, one of the, um, if you're looking to go commercial, there are other considerations to make too. So say for instance, at the moment, transportation regulations don't allow for anything that's critically configured to be moved by road. So that pushes you in the direction of fueling at site. So then you're looking at test work to show that you can safely fuel at site and you can 
defuel at site and remove that fuel away and then effectively leave a reactor in the ground that will remain there for perhaps a year. All of this test work needs to be done um, and all of that information will feed into um, the, the commercial viability uh, assessment of, of the reactor. And there will need to be modifications uh, along the way as you, as you do this work. Um, but there's obviously there's a lot of constraints built around uh, the nuclear industry that you've got to work within to create that commercial product. Jim, anything to add from your end? I would love to see um, the end users of the technology gather together and commit real resources to this scene. And that can be in the form of um, the data centers, Microsoft, Google, I'll pick names, maybe others, and saying, we're going to run a competition and we're going to dedicate money and contracts to those who win the competition. We're going to partner with the U.S. utility sector. Um, and at the end of the day, we'll have dedicated money and contracts. It'll be maybe an 18 month process. And at the end of it, we want action because we need it. And at the same time, I would hope that what I, from what I've seen on the federal side, that what would emerge on that side is a partnership of some form that would also involve capital and commitments. And by marrying those two things, if I were, look, I'll just say, if I were a dictator, that's what I would do. I would just say, you guys go do that and figure this out on the customer side. Federal government, let's go. Because I think there is a real willingness in DC to make changes, but without clear action on the customer end, it's going to be hard to get that. That's, so that's what I would, that's, that's how you break this in my mind. Jim, it, just to follow up on, you know, it's not only the federal government, but we're starting to see states around the country dedicate money uh, for the nuclear industry. Tennessee earmarked $50 million. The governor did earlier this year. A number of other states are looking at what they can do to incentivize uh, the industry to move forward. Do you feel like the states are doing enough right now? Uh, and if not, what more could they be doing? Look, I think that there's a real willingness, Todd. I, I can't really go state by state. But there are a couple of states that have reached out to me of late to start talking about this. So I, I do, look, I try to operate outside my normal arenas when it comes to this space. So I find myself in places that I don't would never have imagined. But let's just say that, yes, I think that there's a strong willingness in certain states to invest and to provide resources and to think through how do we make this industry happen? But look, at the end of the day, um, it's, it's just really the, the way to break this is the demand signal. That's it. And I, I don't know exactly how it happens. I gave you an idea. There's other ideas as well. And that's what really gets things accelerated. It's not like we don't have a positive, you know, we have good momentum now, but to meet the, the goals that you laid out, Todd, and that others have laid out, um, this, this is what I'm talking about. We're going to have to think about things differently because we will not meet those goals. Yeah, I, I like your idea, by the way. And as someone who lives in Loudoun County, Virginia, which is the data center capital of the world, it would be great to see a bunch of micro reactors powering those, uh, those facilities moving forward. Uh, any other questions? I've got a couple right up front. I'm Harry Andreatis, RPE. Um, this question is for James. Um, we've heard a lot that to create customer demand, you need physical hardware or proof of concept, not just a design, but are you creating the infrastructure, building stuff, testing stuff? Um, what's your approach to that? So you're right. I mean, for the, um, for the say, as an institutional level, when you, when you get that kind of big investment in, you need to be able to demonstrate um, you know, a significant amount of progress and development for them to realize that you're real. Uh, and heavily invest in you to create that sort of manufacturing facility or something like that. Um, the, the approach we've had to take is um, we've had to stagger things and we've had to look at the landscape and, and see um, how to build up slowly and only acquire the money we need for certain stages. And um, we're trying to work within the confines of say that the market, for instance. So we don't want to create a company that's heavily diluted in a, sh in a share structure. Um, the public markets look to be a good way to be able to raise um, an initial large amount of capital um, that can go into a serious amount of development work that can advance you to a certain amount, a certain stage that then the institutions can become involved because you are dealing with capital assets, um, demonstration work, test facilities. So um, there are um, uh, programs that are involved um, that the government are looking at at the moment. INL has recently 
um, begin um, advertising programs that allocate land to say microreactor companies, nuclear companies, where they can do this demonstration and test work. And so um, certainly acquiring that kind of land, building things, actually testing them, having physical test work data rather than just computer models um, is gonna be very important because ultimately they just need to see it's real. I mean, that's the real assessment. And that's one of the, the barriers to a big investment coming in is that, well, you know, you, you've modeled this, the physics, according to your probabilistic physics software says it works, but great, you know, like, you know, but ultimately you need to, you need to show nuclear and non-nuclear test rigs operating these things, verifying your models. Um, and even prototypes, uh, I, I know new scale was going to power a, a local utility company. That kind of thing is invaluable. Um, and so you, you, we have to structure the financing in certain ways to just keep pushing us into that point where, where you do need to raise that half a billion dollars, whatever it is, you're in a position to do that. And then it, you've de-risked the investment for these big institutions. Uh, would you mind passing the microphone down? There's a question, a couple down from you. Thanks. So I think this is for Jim again at Guggenheim, but... I think one of the things you said earlier is that there's a lot of disparate technologies. And I, I agree, especially in the SMR space, we have one of everything and you naturally want to pick winners or losers. Like I'm starting to do it in my head, but you know, another thing you said was that the rickover way was kind of a top down and there was a lot of implications on the industry for the next 50 years as a result of that. And so like, what is the best way? It seems like all these things, kind of duking it out, you know, that's creative destruction. That's kind of the American way also. And yet, you know, some of your comments seem to go, well, we just need to narrow this down faster. So I'm just, that's the question. So if you, if you follow my train of thought, I'm not trying to deviate from the free market model. I'm not, I mean, look, I'm telling you, and I've said it, I think we need more grant money and insurance money. I'll just bottom line, we're going to need more. I don't know when it happens, but we will. But what I'm saying is what first needs to happen is either the US utility sector and or the data center guys, they need to get together and decide how important is this? And I'm not, look, I've put myself out there a lot and I'm probably falling into the controversial zone at this point with my utility crowd, but I'm just gonna say it. You know, what usually happens there is that, you know, there's been a lot of great things that have happened for that sector over the last 20 years. We have natural gas, they've been able to reduce carbon because of it. We've had low interest rates. They've been able to reinvigorate the grid and on and on and on. But a lot of times what happens in that space is that they're not going to get ahead of their straight regulators, right? And so what we have on our hands is a potential car crash coming in the form of U.S. utilities not meeting legislative goals, either at the state or federal levels, depending on who's in office, right? And so what does that mean in the end? Does that really matter or not? That's a question for them to answer. But at the end of the day, um, they're going to have to decide how important this is. I'm suggesting they should decide soon that it's really important. They also have this data center crowd and other heavy industry folks showing up on the front doorstep saying, we need a lot of clean and a lot of clean now, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Well, my point is run a competition. That crowd needs to get together, needs to decide on how are we going to orient around this emerging space they should probably get together and collaborate. And oftentimes you collaborate around money. And in this case, it's to me a fund and contracts. Okay, that's what really wields the power in moving this sector forward. And it may be altruistic to say all of that, but at the end of the day, again, if we're gonna meet these goals and if it's really true what we're about to witness, which is an enormous amount of demand showing up for electrons, then and we need clean now, if you believe all that, it's going to take that kind of collaboration to really move this. And then right after that comes the federal government. That's my theory. All right. I think we've got time for Todd, one more question. Todd, we, got, we have one over here. Hi, Valerie Gardner, Nucleation Capital. Um, I want to respond to what Jim said about needing clean electrons and talk, sort of take the conversation in a little bit of a different direction, Todd in particular. I don't think the industry is thinking of itself as a climate solution. I think we need to use the word climate. And I think we need to, I think we're leaving a lot of money on the table in the sense that there are a ton of investors looking for ESG investments, cl clean energy investments, climate solution investments. 
what is the industry doing to identify itself as an ESG solution and to make companies in the sector get high ESG ratings and speak to rating agencies and get more of them to see nuclear as clean? So a couple of questions, ESG and getting into the climate conversation. Yeah, well, you know, I think you make a good point. Uh, the nuclear industry uh, hasn't necessarily been the best in terms of messaging the advantages and benefits of the industry overall. And I think that uh, while that may have been the case in the past, I think the industry is trending in the right direction and is starting to do the things that they need to do uh, to be able to, to message correctly for the, for the overall benefit of the industry. Uh, certainly as an industry organization, part of that responsibility uh, is set before our feet to do. Uh, but also the individual companies and organizations that are members of our, in, uh, of our industry organization have to take that on themselves as well. So uh, your point is very well taken. I will say this, though, uh, and you'll, you'll hear from him later today, but the, the chair of our board, Jeremy Harrell, represents ClearPath. He's their chief strategy officer. Um, and when they talk about nuclear, they're always talking about climate. And so there's, uh, you know, there's good examples out there uh, of that happening. And I think you're right. The industry needs to do a better job. Jim? I look at it really simply. How many people in this room have seen a fuel rod, a spent fuel rod? Maybe because this is the audience we're dealing with. <laughs> if you go out on the street, how many people have seen a spent fuel rod? If you put one down there right now, what would happen? People would run, probably, right? There's a spent fuel rod sitting on the street on the cart. If you light a match on a spent fuel rod, what's going to happen? Right? Nothing. And then if you tell people that you can take all of those spent fuel rods, light them all at once, nothing will happen. And by the way, if you accumulate all of them, you can put all of them on one soccer field, one story tall, all of the spent fuel rods in this country over the last 60 years out of our commercial fleet. This industry needs to be bold and blind. I mean, this industry needs to show people what is it that we're really worried about? I mean, we could all have fun and create a TikTok video and it'd go viral. We could put one right here on that street downstairs and just see what happens. Everybody would watch that, right? And then we would have somebody describe, somebody with authority say, look, the reality is, folks, this is a safe, this is the safest, cleanest kind of energy we have, full stop. And guess what? The stuff that blows up in Russia, and I hate to use, say that, that's different, okay? Here's why it's different. We need to show people what this industry really is. And that's never happened. So we talk about, yeah, we got to educate people. You got to be blunt about this and really blunt and hard and fast because the environmental community destroyed this sector. I come from a family of environmentalists, I don't mind saying this. It's bullshit. And somebody needs to say it. A lot of people need to say it. It needs to be blunt. And now, again. Thanks for that, Jim. All right. Well, we are out of time for this opening panel. But please join me in thanking our panelists. Appreciate you being here today. <laughs>